Welcome everybody to a new post in the TFRP group with Avi Tenenbaum, and today we are not going to be talking about how to fight the Yitzhahara. And I'm making a little bit of a joke, but what I mean is, people are always talking about how to fight the Yitzhahara, and that's an important topic, and we may have some TFRPs about that soon, and that idea comes from Chazal and from many Sfarim after it, but that is not what we're going to talk about, because I feel that there is another side to this battle that people are skipping over. And I'm going to say that today we're talking about what do you bring with you to the fight with the Yetzirah? Not how do you fight him, but what do you bring with you to that fight when you fight him? And I'm going to give you an example from current events. Right now, Rus- Russia, if you're following the news, is seemingly posturing themselves to invade Ukraine. And if you're following this, or if you live in Ukraine, you're probably imagining that the people in Ukraine, the soldiers in Ukraine, are preparing for a Russian invasion. And so those soldiers need to know tactics and strategies, and they have to have weapons, and all that is like fighting the Yetzirah. That's the Darchi Hayetzer, the way of fighting that battle. But you would probably agree with me that those soldiers and those people in Ukraine, not only do they need strategies and tactics and weapons, they also need to get enough sleep for the next few months. They need to eat healthy, and they need to get fit and exercise, and they need to do all sorts of secondary peripheral things that also help them to prepare for battle. They have to psych themselves up mentally to have courage and valor and bravery and have the willingness to go to battle and to face adversary, right? So it's not only about strategies, technical war game strategies and tactics and weapons. When you fight a battle, it's also about a lot of secondary stuff, having a good diet, getting exercise, jogging every day, making sure you're fit, so that the moment that battle starts, you can run around, you can perform as you need to. And that's what I mean by, what do you bring to the fight with the Yetzirah? Not only how do you fight him, but what do you bring with you to that fight? So today's post is all about good Midos and bad Midos, and how by working on ourselves in general and having bad Midos uh, helps us to lust more and to succumb to sin. And if we have good mitos and we're working in general on ourselves in all sorts of general areas of self-improvement, it actually helps us to deal with lust and temptation and especially sexual temptation. So here we go. We're going to jump in and say a bunch of sources on this. Says Reb Chaim Vital in Shar Habdusha in the introduction. He says that by being careful with bad mitos and making sure that we work on those bad mitos, that will help us to easily keep the Torah. Because it's bad mitos that cause us to not keep the Torah. So if you can keep your eye on your faults, on your character defects, and you can work on them, that's going to help you to keep the Torah easier. And he says, he says to shift your focus, don't hyper-focus on just keeping the mitzvahs, because if you only focus on mitzvahs and averas, but not on the midos, the character traits that go behind what inspires and motivates us to do mitzvahs or to not do them and to do averas, then you're missing the boat. Because ultimately, what gets us to do mitzvahs and averas are our character traits. So focus on those and work on those. The Gross similarly says this in Evan Shlema 1.1 that all the sins that people do is based on the bad mitos that they have. Because they have a bad mito, because they have a character defect, that causes them to sin. And the Gross says similarly in Evan Shlema 3.2 sorry, in Evan Shlema 2.6 that by indiscriminately following one's taiva, one's desire over and over and always giving in and never using self-control a person can uproot even the natural inborn good mitos that they have. Which means, let's say a person was born with um, very good mitos, and they're a kind person, and they're thoughtful of other people, and those are great things that can help a person during times of temptation, right? Because let's say a person is really tempted to steal, for the sake of example, and they are a very straight and honest person, and they really work on those mitos, then those mitos might help them to not steal, even though they really want that thing. But let's say a person just gives in to their desire all the time, and they practice giving in and giving in and giving in, and never working on restraint, and never working on those good mitos and maintaining their, their integrity and their honesty, what's going to happen is, the Gra says, their taiva, their lust, can even uproot their natural inborn mitos that they used to have. So there's this connection between character traits and sin. Okay? So follow me here. The Gura says in Evan Shlema 3.2, a fascinating idea, that all sins on a certain level boil down to coveting things that you aren't meant to have. Right? Because think about that. A person wants somebody else's car. 
a person really wants something really expensive that he can't afford, and if he buys it, his wife will get upset, and it cuts into the family savings, right? All these types of things. It's a situation where a person wants somebody else's wife, somebody else's situation, and by wanting things that aren't meant for us, we end up getting into trouble. And so says the Gura in Evan Shlema 3.2, the solution to this is to work on good midos of being very, very satisfied with your situation and with what you have. And if you can work on that over and over and over and really have what he calls midas hahistapkos, to be very satisfied with the things that you have and to be so grateful that you have what you need and that you're not lacking the things that are critical to you, he says that's going to help you to overcome taiva and chemda. So isn't that amazing? So now there's this way of fighting the Yetzir Hara. And it's not only with the Darche Hayetzer and strategies and tactics, and that's all true. But it's even more than that. If you want to work on not looking at pornography, not having bad thoughts about other people's spouses, and all sorts of temptation that we're faced with, we can try to work a lot on believing that what we have is enough. And if we don't have something, we're not meant to have it. And this type of idea. And the more that we're satisfied with what we have, the less that we're going to lust what we don't have. Says the Orchos Tzadikim in Shar Gaiva, that haughtiness creates taiva. When I feel that I'm uh, deserving of everything, and I'm this narcissistic, egocentric person, and that I deserve this, and I should get that, when we become more haughty, it raises our need for new desires. It creates new desires. And so if it's hard enough to fight the Yitzhahara as it is, when we become haughtier people, we have even more desires and we want to take for ourselves even more. And so again, one thing to work on the Eight Sahara is to fight the Eight Sahara. That's true. But what we're saying today is maybe don't even step into the fight with the Eight Sahara. Maybe if we work on Gaiva, which you would think has no connection to Taiva, but it does, if you can work on being more humble, all of a sudden we're not going to have as many desires and we're going to be more happier and, and, and satisfied with what we have. Rabbi Nachman also says in Sefer Hamidos, Gaiva 25, that haughtiness brings a person to adultery into all forms of lust. And that's, by the way, based on a Gemara in Sota, Hey Aleph. Again, you see that haughtiness causes a person to lust. And Rabbi Nachman also says in Lukuti Maran 130, that humility protects a person from lust, because it's the opposite of, hum- of Gaiva, right? So if I'm a haughty guy, and I'm egocentric, and I feel that I'm God's gift to mankind, and I deserve everything, and I'm on the top of the human race, that creates more desire in me. And now I have to contend with that desire. But if I'm humble and I stay in my lane and I'm happy with what I have and I'm satisfied, that helps prevent and protect from lust. Now Rabbi Nachman also says another fascinating thing uh, regarding the connection between character defects and lust. Says Rabbi Nachman in Lakuti Eitzos Bris 10 that There are 70 nations in the world, and each nation has one character defect that they specialize in, and that's what they're known for. This one is, you know, uh, the expert in laziness. This one is the expert in haughtiness. And each one of the 70 nations has something bad about them that they're known for, okay? And Rabbi Nachman says that if you could take all 70 bad character traits and lump them together into one pile, He says, lust is that character trait. He says, lust is the bonfire of all bad mitos, all defects of character lumped together. If you know somebody in the 12-step programs, tell them this uh, class. I think it'll really interest them because they talk a lot about fixing character defects as a way to overcoming lust and temptation. Okay? So said Rabbi Nachman in Lukute Eitzos Bris 10, lust is the bonfire of every bad character defect you can come up with that exists all lumped together in one. Now, if you, unfortunately, are an expert in pornography or these types of things, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. This is not just pure theory. A person that looks at this type of stuff knows that in videos that people watch of pornography or in things that people do when they engage in this type of lust and temptation, you'll see very easily people are taken advantage of, people act with gaiva, and you see that even the sexual acts and way that people do these sins, it's filled with bad midos. Okay, so this is very easy to see for somebody that unfortunately knows what we're talking about. Okay, next we have the story of Yosef and Mrs. Potiphar. Right, so what happens is Mrs. Potiphar, she tries to get Yosef to be with him, and this happens over and over and over. The, the Vilna Gon says at least three times that happened, and Yosef is like, I'm really sorry, Mrs. Potiphar, but I can't be with you because it would be a lack of Hakara Satov to Mr. Potiphar. 
and he also trusts me so much, and I'm, an, I'm a person with integrity. And if I give in and I'm with you and we sing together, then I'm breaking his trust. Now, isn't that a crazy thing? Think about that. Somebody comes to tempt you with sin, with a very gishmak sin, and you say, oh, I'm really sorry, I have a kar satov to your husband, so I can't be together today. So that's a really amazing thing. And it seems like the good mitos of Yosef, of gratitude and integrity, actually got in the way in between him and sinning with Mrs. Potiphar. And who learns this way? If you look in the Sfarno, Rabbeinu Bachaya, Ramban, the Malbim, Chidush Elev, and Lev Elio of Rav Eliyahu Lopian, they all learn according to the way that we said. It was Yosef's integrity and gratitude for Mr. Potiphar and Akar Satov that got in the way between him and sinning. So again, you see the connection between having good character traits and that protecting a person from sin, even from Yosef's situation. Next, we have the Ibn Ezra and Yisro, Parakhaf, Pasuk Yud Dalid, 2014. Says the Ibn Ezra a fascinating thing. He says that we covet things because we think that they belong to us. We think that we deserve them. So he says, if you want to work on not lusting and coveting after things that aren't yours, he says, practice remembering that it wasn't given to you. It doesn't belong to you. It's not meant for you. And he says, for example, if you have a very, very simple farmer, the simple farmer never daydreams that one day he hopes to uh, have relations with the daughter of the king. He says, because he's a simple farmer and he knows that's never going to happen. It's not reality. It's just there's no connection between him and and the daughter of the king, which, by the way, if you look in the story of Mrs. Potiphar, the same thing happens. Mrs. Potiphar is this, you know, stateswoman who has this big mansion and these servants. And it says in the Chazal that originally she wasn't interested in being with Yosef. It was only after she saw that he was a very, very stately person that she felt um, connection to him. And it was through that connection that she said, now I want to be with him. Okay, so you see this thing that if there's something that you feel is connected to you and you can relate to it, you want it. But if you feel that it has nothing to do with you, then you don't want it. And the Ibn Ezra continues and says, why does a person not lust after their mother? Okay, so there's a lot of answers to this. And if somebody struggles with that, so we can give a different class on that. But most people, most of the time, don't have such desires. He says, because you grew up knowing that this is not connected to you. It has nothing to do with you. It doesn't belong to you. It's not appropriate. It's not permitted. And so therefore, it doesn't create desire in you for that thing. So again, says the Ibn Ezra, that the more a person practices this idea, that this doesn't belong to me, it wasn't meant for me, and if it was meant for me, God would have given it to me. I should just stay in my lane and be happy with what I have. And the more we work on that, the less we're going to want things that we shouldn't have. Okay? Says the Sefer HaChinuch in Yisrael 38, that once a person covets something, they're going to obsess about it and do whatever it takes to get their fix, even to rob, to rape, or to kill. So again, we want to keep remembering and practicing, that doesn't belong to me. It's not meant for me. If it was, God would make it permitted. If it was, I would have married that woman. If it was, I would have that car. I'd have that house. And to practice over and over, this doesn't belong to me. It's not mine. And to be satisfied and happy with what we have and to be humble. All these things help with lust. And this is a very unknown, less noticed face on this whole story of fighting the Yitzhar. So if you get into a conversation over this, year, or this show of him about fighting the Yitzhar, tell your friend all about this side of the story, because it's a very unknown side, but all the Sfarm are filled with this um, angle on fighting the Yitzhar as well. And it's not about just fighting the Yitzhar, but what do you bring with you to the fight? Which Midos Tovos do you bring with you to that fight? If you bring to the fight with the Yitzhar gratitude, or you bring integrity, or you bring humility, all of a sudden things get easier. And similarly, if you bring with you bad mitos and tithes for things that are maybe permissible, but in the end you're practicing through the permissible things over and over to give in and to never restrain yourself, like the Masil Sasharm says, uh, you're going to end up sinning, right? Because you're never practicing restraint. Or says Rabin Sion Abishol from the Altar of Kelm, that Lot, right? We know that Lot was infamous for doing incest with his daughters and being drunk, and he is not... Uh, one of the greatest people in history brought down, you know, as a person that we look up to. And it all started with Lot wanting money. He was greedy for money, and he had dishonest business practices with his shepherds grazing the sheep on other people's grass, right? If you remember that story. And because of that story, that's where Avram Avinu and Lot said, you know what, we have to split up. And once they split up, Lot's like, you know what, now that we split up, I can move to a nice place 
So he moved to Stom, and then from Stom, he wasn't exactly with the greatest people. And then after Stom, he had to run away. And then from running away, he went to the cave, and then he got drunk, and he got drunk, and he was with his daughters. So you see that the end of the whole incest story, this debasing, sad, pathetic story of note, it all started with greed for money. It was one bad mita and one bad choice that led to another one, to a third one, to a fourth one. And in the end, he ends up being this type of person in that situation. So the moral of today, pun also intended, is notice our character traits, see what defects we have, work on them, and if we have good midos, keep fixing them, keep sharpening them, sharpening them, and bring them with you to the battle, and those are going to help you fight the war. Okay, great. I hope that everyone has a beautiful week. We should know our character defects. We should be able to look at them straight in the face. It's okay that we have them. We have to know about them, work on them, study them. And we also equally, if not more so, have to know what we're good at, what are our good character traits, and to sharpen those and bring those with us to the fight. Uh, this week, exciting news, by the way, TFRP is not only on YouTube, but soon it's going to also be on a website. So those people that have filtered internet that don't have access to YouTube or don't want to go to such a place, they're going to be able to go straight to a website that we're going to publicize shortly. You can ask your internet filter to open access to the site, and this way you'll be able to see the classes also there as well. Any questions, as always, uh, send questions to tfrpgroup at gmail.com. We always send out the sources as well if you want to look these things up. And uh, if you don't get the sources and you want to see them inside, simply send us an email or look in the description on YouTube. Everyone should have a beautiful week.